time on the Friday after Thanksgiving, because there'll be no layout. And therefore, this week and next Friday, I'm going to be doing some lecturing. And that's why I'm taping it. And I'll be posting it. And this is material. And this way, I can go over it at least twice, three times. And that way, you'll learn it and do well on test four in the final, which is all good stuff. Hi. Right. So for next hour, roughly, I'll be going and doing lecture now. So if you got your notes out or whatever, get ready to take notes. Anybody need paper? Bring paper. All right, we're talking about pH. And pH is a scale that goes from 0 to 14. And when it's below 7, we call that acidic. When it's above 7, we call that basic solution. And when you're at 7, we call that neutral. And neutral pH. Now, let's consider the following. And let's look at the following. And if you consider what happens to the numerical value, and that's important, I'm talking about the numerical value of the pH, if you add to beaker water at pH 7, neutral, a few drops of H2SO4. Well, first of all, you have to know H2SO4 is an acid, a very strong acid. And when you have something that you add an acid to, it will become acidic. And by adding an acid and making it acidic, the pH will drop. Let me have boardroom here. So when you add an acid to a solution, the pH will always drop or decrease. Now, let's look at B. If you have a beaker of water at pH 7, and you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide, you need to know sodium hydroxide is a base, a very strong base. And what happens when something becomes basic? When you add a base, the pH increases. And therefore, it goes up. And you should know this. So anytime you add a base to something, pH will go up. When you add an acid to something, pH will go down. And that's because this is a scale 
When it becomes acidic, the pH is always lower. When it becomes basic, the pH is always higher. Oh, by the way, anybody know why the pH of your stomach is about three? Because there's an acid in your stomach. It's acidic. And remember, this is chemistry, not biochemistry or organic. And don't say, why is the pH, why is your stomach acidic? Because it breaks down food, which is true, but not for this class. It's because there's an acid present in your stomach. And that's there because it does help break down food. All right, now, one of the things that we've done our pH practice time, one of the things I haven't talked about is the reaction of a base and an acid. And that's called a neutralization reaction. When you add a base to an acid, they react to form a salt plus water. If I were to take HCl, which is an acid, and react it with sodium hydroxide, you have a proton transfer, and you'll get a salt plus water. And if you add equal amount to that, the pH will be 7, because there's no, the hydronium ion concentration equals the hydroxide. So when you neutralize something, if you have equal amounts, the pH goes to 7. And it turns out this is very important. And it's important in what we call acid-base titrations. And in acid-base titration, I'll never ask you what it is on a test, but I'll expect you to learn how to use it, is a neutralization reaction in which a measured volume of an acid or base of no concentration is completely reacted with a measured volume of an acid or base of an unknown. And this allows you to calculate many things, like the concentration of the unknown, either acid or base. And this is also used to measure other things that rely on acids and bases, things you, we won't cover in this class. But every day in the United States, there's hundreds of thousands of titrations being done. I worked at a company on the south side of Chicago where I was laboratory manager. And I also managed the quality control lab, the West Coast QC lab. And every morning, all our product types were sampled. And we did certain tests that involved titrations. And uh, I actually, because I thought it was boring for a chemist to spend two or three hours doing titrations every morning, because we had about 60 samples from our storage tanks brought in every morning. I worked with a manufacturer and we automated these titrations to help free up those chemists to do things that were more interesting, at least in my book. And they thought so too. And these titrations are used to measure things like the pH of the cosmetics you buy, hand lotions, so if it's too high or low, that will irritate your skin or do bad things to your hair or other things. Or other things that are measured that measure important aspects of chemicals being made, like vegetable oil and other things like that. Well, when you do a pH uh, titration, how can you change, tell when the pH is exactly at 7? Use what's called an indicator. And the indicator, and this I won't put on a test ever, and I have it on tape that I said that, that the indicator is a compound that changes color at a certain pH. And therefore, if you have an indicator that changes color at pH 7, and you start out below 7, or you start out above 7, when it hits 7, it will change from one color to the other. And the most famous of that is phenolphthalein. And I think, did we use phenolphthalein here? I think we did. Where it turned, something turned a nice uh, purple color or wine color. But I, we did the titration, and we'll do another one. And phenolphthalein is the most famous 
and it's used for that. It used to be used for something else, and all I found it was a very, very, very mild carcinogen, like almost just above the scale it could be. And that was, it was used in a product called Exlax, which I'll let you figure out what that's used for. Now, titrations are used to calculate the molarity of an acid or base. And key points of a titration at neutral pH is when you're at 7. You can calculate the mold of the unknown molarity or acid or base. And based on that neutralization, you can determine how many moles of an unknown molarity acid or base is present in a certain volume. And based on that, you can also determine its molarity, which is important. When you make up a solution, have you made it correctly? Well, a titration allows you to measure that. Because there's ways of making up solutions of exact molarity that you can use as what we call standards. So what does this all break down? If you know the volume, you can calculate the molarity. I just said that. But I'll wait. Remember, everything I put on the screen is available to you through Blackboard. When the pH indicator changes color, you know at that point, the moles of acid equal the moles of base. And the question would be, what is the molarity of an AOH solution if it takes 545 milliliters of a 1.27 molar HCl solution to change the color of, and I could have put in there the indicator, 
or just change the color of 375 milliliters of the NaOH solution. So immediately you know this is titration. How do you know that? Because you're trying to find molarity. And you're given acid in a base. And therefore we know milliliters base time molarity base <coughs> equals milliliters acid times molarity acid. And here we have right here let's do a, what I haven't done and we're trying to find the molarity of the NaOH what are we given? 375 milliliters of the NaOH solution. What are we also given? 545 milliliters of a 1.2727 molar HCl solution. And therefore, we're trying to solve for molarity of base. We're given 375 milliliters NaOH. We're trying to find the molarity of NaOH. We know that we have 545 milliliters of the 1.27 molar HCl. And now we want to solve for molarity of NaOH. How do we do that? We get the loan on one side. How do I get rid of the 375? I divide by that. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. And anything divided by itself cancels out, everybody with me, I now have this, and you notice milliliters divided by milliliters cancel out, and left with molarity, in this case the site is base, that site is acid, and now I'll go to my favorite calculator. The number my calculator gives me is that on test four, like test one, two, and three, it will say please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And notice this is three, three, and three. I'm back in my rug, mainly because I learned did this math with a slide rule, which is only accurate for three significant figures. Keep the one, keep the eight, the four. I'll keep, but. The round off number is five, that's four or higher, so I'll change the four to five. And in this case, the molarity of the sodium hydroxide is 1.85 molar. And this is a standard operation you do all the time. I've lost count how many times. Remember when you had the little squeeze bottle? In real life, you use what's used called a burette. And a burette should be in here. All right, we're chewing gum, really. But anyways, 
I've done this, and one company, let's see if I can find it real quick. can't see it, but this is called an electronic direct, and it's a dosimat, and you can control it, and right here you'll have a readout, this will pump in your solution you're adding, here's what you're titrating, when it changes color like that, you know to stop, you have a button here for stop and go, and these things are accurate to a thousandth of a milliliter. And they're also very fast. And they're also very expensive. I don't know how much they are today, but back in, what was this? 90, I hate to say this, 96. How many of you were born? <laughs> don't raise your hand. But anyways, uh, I was hired by a company to help one of the things improve the QC lab. They're using the old style from the 1800s, Purettes which was manual, not that accurate. And I told the president, we need to get these, because I've used them before at other companies. And back then, they were about 7,500 a piece. And I said, we need at least 10 of them. And that was 75,000. He looked at me, are you sure? I said, you'll make that money back in two months by the quality improvements. He said, let's buy a couple and see if it works. And sure enough, it did because I knew what I was doing, because I'd done it before. And he bought the rest of them. And it helped. And it saved the money, and they made it back. And that's how you do a titration. Let's do one more. On test number four, in important information, I will have four titrations. Remember, milliliters of base times molarity of base equals milliliters of acid times molarity of acid. Why don't you try this one? Just see if you can set it up. What are you being asked to define? What are you given? And what would you put here? All right, what is the molarity of H2S, uh, H2SO4? So here's the acid solution. It takes 631, 631 milliliters of 2.17 molar sodium hydroxide solution. It changed the color of 400, that's not a decimal, 463 milliliters of the H2SO4 solution. And let me erase this. And go ahead and do that.
Notice milliliters cancel out, and you're left with molarity, 
And now I'll go back to my calculator. And this is the number I get, and I'm still in my three significant figure. You round that off to three significant, keep the two, keep the nine, five, seven is used to round off, it's greater than five, so this is equal to 2.96 molar NaOH. And that's how you do titrations. And if I had a penny for every, oh, dollar, let's keep it. For every titration I ever did in my life, well, I'd be a millionaire, maybe. I've done a lot. All right, let's continue on. Now, there's a very important concept in chemistry and acids and bases and called a buffer. And a buffer is a combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base together in a solution. And when you add this together, a buffer resists major change, resists changes when in pH, when a small amount of acid or base is added. Now, your blood is buffered. There's a way your body keeps your pH, your blood, at a very narrow range, even if it gets an acid or base into it. And that's because of a buffer. Now, there's equations how to calculate what the pH of a buffer solution is. I'm not going to go into that. Let me clean the board, because here's the thing you should know. When you add a small amount of a base or acid to a, P, to a buffer, the pH will not change. It stays the same. And let's look at the following. What happens to the numerical value of a pH of a buffer solution if I A, add a few drops of a base, or B, add a few drops of an acid? By definition, a buffer solution resists change in pH when you have a small amount of acid or base. So therefore, if I add a few drops of an at base, the pH, the numerical value, stays the same or does not change. And if I add a few drops of an acid, to a buffer solution. Same thing. The pH stays the same and it won't change. And that's the beauty of a buffer solution 
assume what we call an equilibrium, which I don't teach in this class, and that allows the pH to stay the same. Your blood is buffered. Uh, certain things you buy over the counter medicine and other things are buffered to keep them safe for you. And buffers are a very important part of our daily life, and now you know about it. The end for this chapter, but I'm not done yet. I still have 15, 20 minutes to go. You'll still get out of here early today's lab. Let's move on to the next chapter, and this deals with organic chemistry. Now, I should warn you, if it looks like I'm real happy, I am, because you're on my home court now. I'm an organic chemist. Uh, in a, a couple of lectures that Mike can teach you all of organic chemistry, no. I've taught here, and I'm teaching this semester at the other school, a 16-week survey course in organic chemistry. And am I teaching them everything? No. So, anyways, I will give you enough knowledge so you understand what is organic chemistry and some important parts of it. Now, I will never ask on the test what is organic chemistry. But initially organic, how many of you have heard the term organic, like in organic fruits and vegetables, which is a joke, because all fruits and vegetables are organic. Organic means chemicals that were organic chemicals were initially molecules found in things that were alive. Plants, animals, and us. And the molecules in our body or the plants and all that, someone decided, hmm, these are all similar, and we're going to call them organic, because where they come from? Now that you figure out the word, it's up there. And it turns out that definition was expanded in the early 1800s when a German chemist made organic molecules from inorganic which were never alive. And we had to expand the term organic, and now essentially means mainly, and this is about 99% true, the study of molecules containing carbon atoms and other atoms. And it's almost 100% true, except for sodium bicarbonate is an exception, which is inorganic. So anything with carbon atoms and other atoms are organic molecules. Switches on, big time. When we talk about carbon, carbon has four valence electrons. And because of that, to get an octet, how many more electrons does it need? Eight minus four is four. Oh, <coughs> by the way, what that really means, and everybody look up, you should know that there are four bonds to carbon always. Everybody look up, four bonds to carbon. Both hands on the dexters. Four bonds to carbon. Well, by the way, I kept the secret from you all semester. And that secret is my class, my lectures have been in very high tech, 3D. I mean, so high tech, you don't even need the glasses. Doesn't this look like it's coming right at you? 3D. But you should know there are four bonds to carbon always. And my organic chemistry class, I actually say this for the next two weeks. Beginning of every class, I ask class how many bonds to carbon, and the answer is four. So, carbon can do things most other atoms can't. And this is what makes carbon atom especially wonderful. And that is, it can bond to itself. Most atoms can't bond to itself more than once. And carbons can form chains with or without branches that coming off from the side like branches of a tree, and it can also form rings. And carbon is the basis of all life. Not to scare you, but I will. Everybody, take a second, look up. Look at your skin right now. Touch it. Go ahead, hopefully it won't hurt. That's made up of mainly carbon atoms. Your skin has molecules made up of protein, which is amino acids, which is carbon organic chemistry, which I won't teach you here, but you take it. So the important thing from this slide is there are always four bonds to carbon. Four, four. I can even do this with my eyes closed. 
more bonds to carbon. So, uh, all right, switches on in organic chemistry. Unlike other classes, there's almost zero math, but there's a lot of memorization. How many of you have heard in today's news about pollution and hydrocarbons? What's a hydrocarbon? Well, you should know that's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. So a hydrocarbon is a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. And one of the simplest hydrocarbons is, remember, there's four bonds to carbon, and in organic chemistry, we usually don't show the bonds. And one way of drawing a molecule would be this way. And this tells me there's one carbon and four hydrogens. This has a name, which I won't ask you to remember, but it's called methane. You know what it has. natural gas. And that's what you burn if you have a gas stove at home. If where you live, you have a gas uh, heater, especially in this weather. And if you have a gas water heater, you're burning this compound to make heat. And it's a hydrocarbon. How do you know? It has only carbon and hydrogen. Another hydrocarbon, and this is where you can see carbons form chains. These carbons are bonded together. Another way of drawing this here a line represents a pair of electrons in a covalent chemical bond. And this is called propane. And that's the stuff in the white tank you buy for your barbecue. And that's a hydrocarbon. This is called propane. And notice it has only hydrogens and carbon. And it's a hydrocarbon. This molecule you also burn to make your steaks, hot dogs, and hamburgers. Now, when it comes to hydrocarbons, there's two types you should know. It only has carbon-carbon single bonds. And you learn about one pair of electrons being shared between two atoms is a single bond. And these are saturated hydrocarbons. Now the other type of hydrocarbon is unsaturated hydrocarbons. And you should know unsaturated means it's a hydrocarbon, it's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms and contains one or more carbon-carbon multiple bonds, like a double bond or a triple bond. Now, if we look over here at propane and methane, those are both saturated hydrocarbons. They both have carbon, hydrogen, and there's only carbon, carbon, single bond. Now, an unsaturated one, oh, by the way, I'm going to get some really scary stuff in organic chemistry, so be prepared. a molecule, and don't write this down, called beta carotene. Every bend in the line is a carbon. Every end in the line is a carbon. So there's a lot of carbons. I'll teach you later on. This we call a ring. Here's a carbon here, here. They don't show it. This is shorthand at my level. And you notice there are two lines between these two carbons. And that indicates a double bond. Now this is called beta carotene. Where do you find it? in carrots. And this molecule, because of the double bonds, can absorb light. What colors of light doesn't it absorb? Or the ones that make up orange. And carrots are orange because of this. Now, how many of you have heard carrots help your eyesight? 
right, for Bugs Bunny, because your body breaks this down to another molecule called the common name retinal. I wonder where that's used. Retinal is important for your eyesight. And by eating this and other forms of these type of molecules, your body can make chemicals that help your eyes. So it's true. That's why Bugs Bunny could see well, because he ate a lot of carrots. And this is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. It only has carbon hydrogen atoms and it has carbon carbon double bond. Triple bond is something, oh, by the way, you know who's the greatest of all organic chemists? Mother Nature. You just have to look around. This is Mother Nature's work. Mother Nature never did a triple bond. Organic chemists created that. So, but we still call them both unsaturated. Switches off. Now, when we study organic chemistry, we have certain groups of atoms always connected or bond together. We call those functional groups. And they always have the same chemistry and the same function. All right. Everybody here came through a door to come from that side of the wall to the side of the wall. At least I hope you did. Any ghosts here? No. All right. Now, when you came in this building, you came from one side, outside, to inside, just like here. Was that the same door? Did it look like this? No. That's because you know the function of something that looks like this. A door is to come in and out of the room. Bye. Bye. I better come back. And it turns out in the open is so crispy. Uh, uh, Tiffany can get that. And there are different types of functional groups. By the way, once it hits new and tell me we better start to lay out. So I'm in a zone. Now, don't write this down. There are different types of functional groups. I know these like I know my first name. Trust me, I do. And there are different ones that play a role in your daily life. Alcohol. How many of you have heard the term alcohol before? Alcohol is the functional group. You think of alcohol, which is the molecule ethanol, which is in wine, beer, and hard spirits, you know, like the good stuff, vodka. And it has this structure. And when you have a carbon with a OH, which is called the hydroxyl group, we call that an alcohol. Now, not all alcohols will get you inebriated. And there are other ones. Quick, sell that stuff. Oh, hold on. How did you know that wasn't President Trump? <laughs> I doubt it. Anyways, we may have been calling you John. And functional groups always react the same way. There are a few exceptions, and that's the beauty of it. And how to find a functional group in a molecule? When you're looking at a molecule, switches on. You should know how to identify a functional group in a molecule. Whenever you see an atom that is not carbon or hydrogen, or if you see a double bond or triple bond, two lines, that's a functional group.
and let's take a look at these. And the question would be two points each, circle the functional group in each of the following. And it might be more than one. Here I've made these and there's only one. So how do you do that? You look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen. Ooh, oxygen. And this is a functional group. It's called a ketone. I'm not asking you to learn that. If we look, ooh, another oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon. This is a functional group. It's called an alcohol. And let me do one more functional group that I forgot. And why don't you try B, uh, C and D on your own, circle the functional group or functional groups in those molecules. By the way, tonight at midnight I'll be giving lessons in speed structure drawing. I need more time. I'll be up on the board. Let's look at this molecule. Ooh, look. To this carbon, I have a carbon double bond to oxygen plus another oxygen to hydroxyl. It's called a carboxylic acid. There's a functional group. And this one, I have not one, but two functional groups. This is called the amino group. This is called the carboxylic acid. Did I tell you organic chemists are very lazy? And technically, this D should be called an amino carboxylic acid. An amino carboxylic acid. Let me show you my jaw. That's too much to say. I'm just going to call this an amino acid. And that's the structure of one of your amino acids. And it's called an amino acid because it has an amine functional group and a carboxylic acid functional group, but we're too lazy to say the whole thing. And that's how that came about. Let me do one more thing. You'll still get out of here by 10 after 11, which is still way early. I could go till another hour when I'm home. The important thing you need to know is how to draw organic molecules, simple ones. And the important thing is how to put in the hydrogens. Class, how many bonds to carbon? Everyone. Four. Ah, that was pitiful. Come on. It's sunny out. Christmas is coming, so it's Thanksgiving. Fire up. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Thank you. So if I do this, Oh, by the way, when I teach organic chemistry, math is real hard. I don't let my students use a calculator on a test. For two-thirds of the semester, they have to know, or well, the whole semester, they have to know how to add and subtract up to four. And also, for this class, you won't have to how to count up to ten. That's the math in organic. So that when I teach it. But if I were to ask for this structure, 
put in the hydrogen. How do you put in the hydrogens in that molecule with three carbons bond together? The line is a bond. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Oh, by the way, if you have nightmares of me doing that, I'm, I apologize. But anyways, let's look at this first carbon. How many bonds to it? One. How many bonds should carbon have? Four. So four minus one is three. So we now put in three hydrogens, and you usually do that to the left of the carbon. But on the ends, you can do on this one left or right on the left carbon. Now, let's take a look at this carbon. How many bonds to that carbon? Count the lines. One, two. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Four minus two times up. Oh, we all got two. So there's two hydrogens. Let's take a look at this last one. How many hydrogens should be on there? How many bonds to carbon? Four. Four minus one, three. Now, you can have branching. And that would be branching. And I'll let you try this one. And that would be putting the hydrogens on each carbon. Remember get out of your way so you can see it. Can you see it now? Remember, four bonds to cover. done, so let's do this. How many bonds to carbon? Four. How do I know how to put in the hydrogens? How many bonds to that carbon? One line, one bond. There should be four. Four minus one is three. Three hydrogen. This one, how many bonds to that? One. So four minus one, three hydrogens. I'm going to skip this one come back. This one, how many bonds? Two. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Four minus two, Two and this last one, how many bonds to carbon? Four. It has one bond, one line. Four minus one is three. And now let's go to the hard one. How many bonds to that carbon? One, two, three. How many bonds should carbon have? Four. And four minus three. Ooh, high level math. And hopefully you all got one. That's how you do that. And let's take a five-minute break. I'm going to get my camera down and then We'll start to lay out. 